Let's just remain in his presence tonight. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your mighty presence in this place. Hallelujah. Genesis chapter 28. Let's begin in verse 10. And Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he lightened upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed. And behold, a ladder set upon the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven, and behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac. The land whereon you liest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed. And thy seed shall be as dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in thee and in thy seed shall all families of the earth be blessed. And behold, I am with thee and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest and will bring thee again into the land. For I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. And Jacob awaked out of his sleep and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I knew it not. And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place. This is none other but the house of God. And this is is the gate of heaven and Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillows and set it up for a pillar and poured oil upon the top of it and he called the name of that place Bethel but the name of that city was called Luz at first and Jacob vowed a vow saying if God will be with me and will keep me in his way that I go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on so that I come again to my father's house in peace then shall the Lord be my God and this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house and of all that thou shalt give me I will surely give a tenth unto thee. Father God, we just thank you tonight for your word. Lord, I thank you that the work that you began, you will be faithful to complete it. God, I thank you tonight that you are able to perform that which you have promised. I thank you, God, tonight that you never leave us and you will never forsake us. That everything that you have promised, regardless of how we feel or what we see, God, we stand upon your word. Lord, that our children will be saved. Lord, that you will be Jehovah Jireh, our provider. That God, you will restore all the years that the locusts have eaten. God, that you will heal our bodies. God, that you will make a way where there is no way. Father, we thank you tonight that you are not a man that you should lie, nor the son of man that you should repent. God, we thank you that the gifts and the callings of God are irrevocable, God. We thank you, God, that you do not change your mind concerning your word over us, oh God. I thank you tonight, God. That your word has the power, Father God, to set us free. I thank you that this, the blood of your son Jesus, that it cleanses us, that it sets us free, that it keeps us from shame, Lord God. Lord, that we have been made the righteousness of God through the blood of your son Jesus. I thank you tonight for your faithfulness, God. Lord, I thank you tonight that you can 
heal the brokenhearted God. Lord, I thank you that there is no situation tonight, God, that is impossible for you, God. I thank you, Lord, that every mistake that we've ever made, that every regret that we've ever lived with, that God, you are going to turn every situation around for good because your word has promised it, Father God. I declare tonight and I decree over every person that is in this place, that is listening to this video, Lord, that is hearing this tape, that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. I praise you and I thank you, Lord. Holy Spirit, I ask tonight that you would just remove every spirit of distraction. Lord, help us to get our minds off of what we don't have. Give us ears to hear and eyes to see what the Spirit is saying tonight because we'll need this word from tonight and going forward, Father God. I thank you, Lord, that you are going to protect the seeds that are planted tonight and the enemy will not be able to steal them, Father God. And Lord, I ask you, God, that you would give us, just give us those ears and give us those eyes, Father God, that we might hear and see, Father God, what you hear and see. And Lord, let your word flow from my lips. Let it go forth like seed. Let it not return unto you void. But let it set the captive free tonight, God. Let it bring illumination and revelation. Let it bring deliverance. Let it bring healing. Let it bring strength. Let it bring grace, oh God. Let it bring conviction. Let it bring direction, Father God. I thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord, in advance for the harvest that's coming forth through this seed tonight, Father. I praise you and I thank you when all God's people said, amen and amen. You may be seated. And let's really just stay in the attitude of prayer in the presence of the Lord. His presence is in this place. God is, is doing something. Amen. God is turning all things around. I don't care what you're going through right now. I just need you to try to shake what you can off and just focus tonight because I believe that God has got a word of deliverance for you, a word of restoration for you. As we are in this series called Behold, I Make All Things New. I want to talk to you on the subject tonight, being caught between Two Thieves. The title of my message, Being Caught Between Two Thieves. The enemy does nothing but to come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. God says, my word goes forth like seed, and it doesn't return unto me void. God, when he speaks, he speaks not to thrill, not to excite, but to impregnate his people with purpose, with his will. He, I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. And because that weapon is formed, it doesn't mean, and, and because the enemy knows it's not going to prosper that doesn't mean that the enemy is not going to try to stop you and to stop what it is that God has for you. The battle that we face every day of our lives, do not get it wrong. It is not a battle between flesh and blood, but it is a battle against powers and principalities. Do not look at your situation and think that this thing is just about you and your need and in your situation. This whole battle comes down to a war of words. God's worst words versus the enemy's words. It's a battle of words. Each and every one of us is a spoken word of God. Can you say amen? amen? We learned last week that emotions are not bad. If you deny your emotions, it's denying the God that is in you. God himself has emotions because God himself created emotions. Emotions are not bad, and God would have never created something that was bad and put it inside of his children. 
Think about it logically and realistically. God would have never put something in you that was bad. But what the enemy does is he takes what God meant for good and uses it for evil. That is why emotions aren't bad, but God says your emotions are basically a slave to you. But when we become emotional and we allow our emotions to run us, that's where we come into trouble because nothing should be controlling us and nothing should have authority over us other than the word of God. Can you say amen? amen. So the emotions are not bad. You can be angry and sin not. When you're going through something, we spoke about it last week, when you're grieving something, grieving the loss of something, if it's a relationship, if it's, if it's a material thing, if it's about a trauma, if it's about innocence, whatever it is in your life that you have lost, it is God's given gift for us to be able to grieve and go through the process. I was speaking to, uh, I heard it somewhere, um, that Jewish people, they don't necessarily believe in an afterlife. But they understand this, that the grieving process is so key to healing. That there are some Jewish people that will take off of work up to a year just to grieve. Some people have jobs and they get five days bereavement to grieve, and then they've got to get back. You can't grieve something in five days. Can't do it. But God gives us these different tools to be able to go from one place to another. The reason that people become emotional is because faith is lacking. If faith is lacking in your life, it allows the emotions to take over. Because in the presence of faith, fear cannot exist. I have faith that I know no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Because I've been through some stuff even before I was here. The enemy came against my mother's body and she was told she could never have children. After she had my brother, doctor said, you better stop while you're ahead. You have one. But the word of God was spoken and there was a word named Karen that had to get to the earth. Now once Karen got to the earth, there were a lot of people that said Karen wouldn't make it. That Karen was this and Karen was that. But God said, Karen is my child. And God said, Karen's my child and I've called her by name. Now, God just didn't say this about Karen. God said this about every single person that's in this room. That's why you are here tonight. Because the enemy knows that. The enemy knows and he is kicking and screaming and doing everything he can to pull you out of position, to get you all emotional so that you're not thinking clearly. There are three phases of faith. There is faith, there is trust, and there is knowing. Again, it's a kingdom principle. There's 30, 60, and 100-fold. Faith is 30-fold. Faith is something that we know God can do something. And everybody has been given a measure of faith. Everybody has a measure of faith. But as you begin to walk and you go from a 30-folder to a 60-folder, you will notice after you've walked with the Lord sometime that your battles and your heartbreak get increasingly harder 
and more severe. You're fighting things now that you couldn't fight 20 years ago. But God never gives you what you can't handle. See, the struggle you're going through, God has given you the strength for the struggle. Each and every one of us have been uniquely designed and uniquely anointed for the struggle that you're facing. Doesn't feel like it. But the Bible says we don't walk by feelings and we don't walk by sight. We walk by faith. So there comes that point where when you hit a battle, and yeah, I have faith, I know God's going to do it, but this thing, it's getting hot in here. It's the midnight hour. Life is calling. The bank is calling. The kids are hungry. My, my, my son, my daughter is about to go to jail. Whatever it is, I'm getting old. Whatever it is. And you're looking at your plan and you're not understanding how God is going to do it. That's when you graduate from being a 30-folder to a 60-folder. And faith moves to trust. God, I don't know how. I don't know when. I don't know what. But God, I'm taking this whole thing and I'm dumping it in your lap. God, you've promised me a husband. I see the vision. I can, I can see the house. I see the children. But I have no prospects. <laughs> There's no way. God, you gave me this house, and I got to keep this house. But they're telling me I'm going to foreclose. So God, either you're going to save this thing, or you're going to bring me something better. So God... Trust says, I'm not telling you anymore how to do it. I'm not even telling you what I want anymore. But trusting God goes to a place, God, have your way. Because I know your way is best. Even if I don't like the process, the end result is going to end up in my best interest. Because your father in heaven has a nature to love and it's his pleasure to give you good gifts. God doesn't curse you. God doesn't abuse you. You need to get it out of your forehead, rubbing out, that what you are going through is a punishment. This is not a punishment. Did you make some wrong choices? Yeah. Did you make some mistakes? Yes. Did you have some people throw you under a bus? Absolutely. But what I'm going through is not because God punished me, but it's because I was a spoken word of God. I am a promise. And the fact that I have had all of hell coming against me, my body, my mind, my children, everything that pertains to me is the confirmation that the word that God spoke was the truth. It was the truth, and I just have to stand there and believe. So when you go from being a 30-folder to a 60-folder, and you go from faith to trust, you come to the kingdom mindset, which is a hundredfolder, which is knowing. God, I know. I know you're going to do this. In fact, I don't have to sweat it. I don't have to cry about it. But God, I know that I know. Why? Because I want to know you in the power of your resurrection. See, when I know him in the power of his resurrection, I come to the place 
where my heart, my mind, and my mouth come into complete and total agreement where we can say like Paul, I know that my Redeemer lives. And there's not a question anymore, can God or will God? But I know no matter how God chooses to do it or what he chooses to do, God will do it because we are a spoken word. God doesn't abort his word. God doesn't abort his children. We see that in the book of Genesis when Adam and Eve messed up. God didn't abort them. He didn't destroy them. He didn't say, I'm going to store it all over because the first type wasn't the good type. I'm going to work with what I created because my first word is my final word. And I'm not changing it. So when our emotions begin to control us, because sometimes, let's be honest, when you are going through a battle and things start to become unglued. Anybody understand what I'm talking about when I say unglued? It's like I, I, I'm grasping here, I'm grasping there, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to hold on, and I can't hold on to anything. I call that being unglued. It's like having spiritual vertigo. Anybody have vertigo in the natural? I had that one day. Scared the daylights out of me. I pray nobody gets this thing. I was laying in bed, and I opened up my eyes, and the room was literally spinning. Tried to get out of bed, and I was falling down. And that's what it feels like when you're in the battle of a lifetime. Some of you have spiritual vertigo right now. And the problem is, when you have spiritual vertigo, your emotions become out of control. That's why we like to control our emotions, which is a good thing. But sometimes God has got to mess some stuff up to reveal to us where we are in that 30, 60, and 100 fold. Because when you start getting pressed, and when you start getting emotional, and you start feeling unglued, the first thing you got to do is take a step back and say, why am I feeling like this? Where is my faith at? Am I at 30? Am I at 60? Am I at 100? Or am I at 10? Amen? So you need to kind of step back and take an evaluation. That's why that self-examination is so important. Because only you and God know exactly where, you, where, where you're at. So when we become emotional... And allow our emotions to control us. And I want to say this. Because you're going through something, or when you're grieving something, you will become emotional. That kind of emotion is not negative. Don't throw the baby out with the bath water. When you're grieving something, you're going to cry. There's, I'm talking about when your emotions are controlling you. When you've got so much fear that you won't do something, that's an emotion controlling you. But walking through something, you might experience some fear because it's a scary thing. Do you understand the difference? This is really important, so I want to make sure that you're really getting this and understanding it. What the enemy wants to do, and I believe the biggest torment, is he wants us to live in the land of I wish, I woulda, coulda, shoulda. Understand that God is not a victim to our past, nor is God disgusted by our past, nor is he intimidated by our past, 
by our mistakes and by our failures. It's the exact opposite. When God sees a mistake, when God sees a struggle, when God sees something's going wrong in your life, God gets excited. Because the way God sees it, he sees it as an opportunity to reveal his glory through your life. He gets excited because he says, you see, my word is not going to return unto me void. Because it's until I have that struggle, there's really no opportunity for God to step in and do something. Amen? Stay with me. I'm going somewhere. The test that you're going through right now, the battle that you're going through right now, has nothing to do with your past. It has nothing to do with your present. But it has everything to do with your future. God does not live in your past. He is in your present, but he wants to take you to your future. That's why when God does something wonderful in your life, the enemy is always going to step in and do something that's going to cause what God is doing to look as though it is not as spectacular as it really is. God is a God of movement. He's a God of, of progress, development, and multiplication. He is constantly taking us from glory to glory to glory. The Bible declares that in him we live, we move, and we have our being. It's the devil who wants us to be stuck. He doesn't want us to be able to move. That's why he uses fear. Why? Because fear immobilizes you. It keeps you in a place of being stagnant, of bringing no change and no movement. He knows if he can get us to dwell he knows if we forget what lies behind us and we reach to what's in front of us, he's lost his power. Because all the devil has is our past. Because the devil has no creative power. Because everything that's been created has already been created. There is nothing more to create. When God created everything, he said this is good I'm done. I'm finished. And he rested. Many of us have to deal with this thing called regret. We have to deal with this awful question of, what if while I was going through something, I missed God? Anybody ever have that fear? What if I missed God? What if this was a divine opportunity? Do those moments roll around again? I mean, I can't give me, you know, I, I, my years back, you know, if I was supposed to do it younger, you know, I missed that time. Can I do it now? But somehow God says, I'm going to make all things new. So the devil wants us to stay in this place of regret. And when we stay in the place of regret, that's where we get caught between two thieves. The first thief is the regret over our past. The past keeps dwelling on the, I missed God. What would I be doing if I made a different decision? What would have happened and where would I be if I, if I listened to a different voice, if I made a different choice? 
what would have happened and who would I be if they didn't throw me under the bus? Because there are some things that we've chosen, but there are some things that happened. And neither one of them is a picnic. And it's frustrating because I can't change the past. That's why I said last week, forgiving somebody is hard because we think of forgiving somebody is excusing them from what they did as if to say, it's okay, don't worry about it. Because it's not okay. The devastation is there. The mindset's been there. It's not okay. But I forgive because I'm releasing myself from the power that the person or the situation, the trauma had over me. I'm walking away from it. The other thief is anxiety and fear. We're so stuck dwelling in the past, but I have anxiety and fear about my future. Well, I've had so many disappointments. Nothing has worked for me. Everything I've done, everything I've chosen has been a disaster. What makes this time different than any other time? Fear is a paralyzer paralyzes. It immobilizes us. It immobilizes us to move. That's why God says fear is a spirit. And he says in that spirit, it doesn't come from me. That's why the moment that fear creeps up in your life, you've got to say fear is here because faith is not working. And God says you can ask him and say, Lord, as a disciple said, help my unbelief. And when the fear comes, stop being polite and rebuke it. See, the problem is that sometimes we invite unwelcomed visitors because we're not rude. When the strong man is in your house, the Bible talks about it. How do you get him out? You got to bind him. The kingdom of God suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. When I understand that there's a battle going on because I'm a spoken word, I can't lay down and be polite to the devil. God has given an expiration date on certain things in your life, and because of fear, the milk has gone bad because the expiration date is up. But you're living in that circumstance because you've not told the devil where to go. You've not told fear where to go. You've not rebuked it. You've not said, release me in the name of Jesus. Or if you have, you still let it talk to you. Because understand, just one rebuke is not going to send the devil running. Because it's a life. See, to be to be a hundredfolder, to be in that place of knowing It's something, it's constant. It's a constant battle. It's constant coming back with the same thing. Because the devil is not going to come up in a fight with you and get knocked down once and then be afraid and run away. I can tell you the devil's not not only going to come back, but he's going to come back harder. He is persistent. And when he gets angry enough, he starts taking everything out of his artillery. That's why you count it all joy when you fall into various trials and temptations. Because if the battle is getting heated, you got to know you're making progress. You got to know God is pleased with you. Because understand, kingdom is always opposite of the natural. And we are in this world, but we are not part of this world So our thinking cannot be carnal. Our thinking has got to be spiritual. That God, what I see in my spirit is my reality. I'm living a lie. My son's not saved. My daughter's not saved. I can't pay my bills. That's the lie. 
But Lord, I see them saved in my spirit. I know what your word says. I know your word says that you've never seen you see the righteous forsaken or your seed begging for bread. I know that that's got to be true. I know it is true. Regardless of what I'm saying, I'm going to believe your word and take you at your word. So many times what happens is you're stuck between two things that are robbing you. You're stuck in your past. You can't get out of it. You can't forget that thing. You're still living in, what if this would happen? What if that would happen? What if, what if my innocence wasn't lost? What if, what if I would have gone here? What if I would have gone there? You're caught between that and you're caught. And on the other side, there's fear and anxiety. But I'm afraid to shake things up. I'm afraid to bust through this thing. Because the enemy has convinced us that we've already lived the best and that things can only get worse. But the Bible declares that our latter will be greater than our past. See, we get emotional and we forget our brains. We check our brains at the door. We're looking for some deep and heavy revelation. But if sometimes if we just read the word to read the word and not even go deep in the word, you will see that everything that you are believing is a contradictor, is contradiction to what the word of God says. And if what you are believing, regardless if you think you are so right, and this is the way it's been for the past 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 years, if it doesn't line up with the word, it only means that it's a 30, 60, 80, 90 year lie that you've been believing. The length of time that you've believed something doesn't make it more true. It just means that you've dug a deeper hole. And it just means that you're stuck. But thank God... God, he can unstick you. Amen? You don't have to be stuck between that. There's a quote that says, don't let the good become the thief of the best. I'm afraid to dream because the risk of being disappointed is worse than never having anything at all. It's the opposite of that other saying that says, it's better to have loved and lost than never loved at all. At least those who have loved and got out there, those who try, have tried something. Because you only really, really lose when you never try. Because the only ones who fail are the ones who try. The ones who don't fail are the ones who sit there and never accomplish anything and want to criticize everybody else. Different sermon won't go there tonight. It's the difference between being numb and feeling pain. It's so easy to be numb because I can just go through life on Zoloft or one of those pills and Xanax and I can just, I could just stay like this. Don't, don't let me feel anything. I'm okay. I'm okay. And it's nice to be doped up. It's nice to be, I don't have to feel, I don't like to feel pain. The only thing about pain is pain allows you to know, hey, something's wrong. You're alive. We got work to do. I don't want you staying in this place. That's what pain does. But here God gives us these things called bridges and ladders. Tonight we read about Jacob having a ladder. And last week we talked about a bridge um, that grieving is the bridge between dealing and healing. Bridges and ladders are created to get you from one place to another. Bridges and ladders are created to get you from one place to another. Bridges and ladders are temporary. You can't live on a bridge 
and you can't live on a ladder. I will tell you, you cannot live on a ladder. <laughs> Especially if your name is Karen. Karen doesn't like ladders because ladders don't feel like there's support. And when you have a little problem with heights and stuff like that, you don't want to fall. There's, there's fear that comes in that. They're tools, and they're great tools. Um, problem is, is that many of us, and I want you to get this picture in your head, and if you close your eyes, you'll begin to see it. And if you say, God, where am I right now in my process? You can see yourself stuck on a bridge between your past and between your future. And it's not a comfortable place. You can see yourself on a ladder. I'm a little higher than I was, but I'm not as high as I need to go. This bridge or ladder, whatever you see in your, in your heart or in your mind, it's called a wilderness mindset. Oppressed mindsets find the wilderness a comfortable place to live. Because sometimes it's just comfortable and it's safe spinning your wheels. Israelites were only supposed to be there 11 days. They stayed 40 years. Big difference. 11 days to 40 years. It's easier to give up and give in than it is to stand up and face and fight and conquer. The Israelites, they were delivered from Egypt. They were in this wilderness because really a bridge and a ladder is nothing but a place of transition. But because they kept dwelling in the past, they kept seeing, you know what? When we were in Egypt, yeah, we, we were in bondage, but you know what? We had food. We had three meals a day. And realizing, not ever realizing that they're in the wilderness and they still got three meals a day. Their clothes and their food. They, their clothes never wore out. And they never went hungry. The wilderness was a place of miracles. See, most of us don't like the wilderness. I mean, we do like it because it's comfortable. I don't have to move anywhere. But the wilderness experiences in your life, the bridges and the ladders, those transition period, birth faith. They birth that moving from a 30 to a 60 to a 100-folder. The wilderness is what births maturity. Is this making sense to you tonight? So it's easier to give up and then to move on. The problem is the word that God spoke to you will never give up. It will nag you over and over and over again. It's like an alarm clock. You can roll over in the morning and you can keep hitting the snooze button and you'll get 15 more minutes or five minutes, but eventually the alarm clock is going to keep ringing and ringing and ringing until you get yourself up and you turn the alarm clock off and say, I'm getting out of bed. This is my day, and I've got to start my day. So when your life has become the snooze alarm, and you keep wanting to go back to bed, the word of God that was spoken that won't return unto God void keeps waking your sleepy self up. Because God is saying, I have better for you. But we say, not consciously, but I'm okay with where I am. 
I want to sleep some more. And God says, you're not sleeping anymore. I need you up. That's why sometimes when we've bottled stuff up emotionally for so long and we've become comfortable in that place, and over the past year or so, many people in this room have been saying, I don't know what's wrong with me. I keep crying for no reason. My life and my, my emotions, everything seems to be spinning out of control and I can't seem to get a grip on it. It's because you're putting it on snooze and God is waking you up. I'm just trying to explain where you're at to give you some clarity so that I can give you some direction of what's happening. Because you're listening to the enemy who's telling you that while this was going on in your life, that God looked the other way and he wasn't there and he didn't know what was going on and he, he, he abuses you so that he can use you. And, and then that, that verse about, you know, you have to fellowship in his sufferings, meaning that people think that, you know, well, if I don't suffer and I'm not going around this thing and I'm not living in pain and I'm not living in depression, then God must not be using me. No, the devil is a liar. And you've been believing that lie for too long. So we, don't, we want change, but we don't want anything to change. Fix me, but don't touch me. Heal me, but don't ask me anything. And it can't happen. So what God does is he begins to just wake you up. You know, Sammy used to do something that you, it, it's very funny, but it used to flip me out. See, Charlie and Kimberly, whenever they wanted me and I was sleeping, they would come in the room, door would bust open, ma! But Sammy, she would always come, and she does it till this day. She will come in and I'll be laying in bed. I have my eyes closed and I feel this presence. Because she understands mom's sleeping and her brother and sister are rude. So in her mind, she's being polite. But she stands there and she just waits for the response. I'm going to wake up because I have something to ask you. But you can't get mad at me because I'm, I'm not coming through the door like that. And that's just what God does. You're sleeping but there is this overwhelming presence <laughs> that just stands there. You getting up? Getting up? Hello? Time to get up. And the patience of that child is like the patience of God. There is no rolling over and turning the other way. I can't ignore my child any more than I can ignore God Almighty in my life, that when God is coming and he's starting to wake you up because you've been in this place too long, you've been in this place of pain, in this place of abuse, in this place of a, of a poverty mindset. Poverty has everything to do with money, but, you, but it has everything to do with everything else in your life. It's not all about money. A poverty mindset is when you just think there's just never enough. Or God won't do it. There's not enough of me. It, can, it, it encompasses everything. So I said all of that to get to our text tonight. And let's go back and review a little bit about this man named Jacob. I'm sure many of you are very familiar with the story. I know I've preached a lot about him. But let's go back to his family history to kind of understand what has brought him to this place. Because he is stuck between two thieves. We start off with his family, his father Abraham. Abraham receives two promises from God. He says he'd be the father of nations, and God says, I will give you this land. He struggles doing things God's way. So Abraham, the father of our faith, 
has got a problem with process. How do we know that? Well, he's got the, the, uh, the, the stint in Egypt where he tells Pharaoh that his wife is his sister. Um, God's telling him that he's going to have a son. Him and Sarah, well, Sarah comes up with the whole Hagar idea. Um, but finally, Abraham and Sarah, they have Isaac. Does anybody see the Bible? Okay, if you would have saw the segment um, with Abraham and Sarah, I loved the way Sarah was looking at Abraham when Isaac comes back off that mountain and she's embracing her son, but she's looking at Abraham like, boy, you are lucky this child is home. Because it's God speaking to Abraham. That's why Abraham is faith and Sarah is known as grace. Because God doesn't speak to Sarah. And Sarah, Sarah's got to stand back like grace does it and allow, allow God to move. If you haven't seen it, look at it. You'll see what I'm talking about. So then Isaac, um, the son of Abraham and Sarah, he marries Rebekah and they have twins, Esau and Jacob. And Esau, he's, he's a man of the earth. He's a man's man. He's, he's daddy's favorite. He's a sportsman. He's an outdoorman. Basically, you know, in our terms today, he's the all-around dumb jock. <laughs> Jacob is a little different. He's mama's boy. Mama loves, mom, mama loves, mama loves him. And, and he hangs out with mama in the kitchen. And, and, and he's really listening to her. And he's always a trickster. Uh, he was born grabbing the heel. In fact, that's his name, the one who grabs the heel. He's known as a trickster, or I, I got another uh, translation. He's a ham, he's uh, him who grabs the heel, who's hamstr he hamstrings people. So there's, there's two key moments in, in the history. Um, he exhorts his brother Esau out of his birthright. If you remember, Esau wanted to, he sold his birthright for a, for a pot of lentils, and he 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 follows his mother. Jacob follows his mother's instructions to trick his father out of the family blessing, and Esau is ready to kill his brother after his dad passes away. Rebecca hears of this, and she arranges for Jacob to leave and make a quick exit to go find a wife in their homeland. So now you hear that you 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 hear the family history, not the most functional family, not the most trusting in God, and you know. You want to blame Jacob and call him all that he was, but honestly, his grandmother didn't trust God because she was the one who made Abraham go with Hagar, you know, and Rebecca is just following the same pattern. If God's not moving fast enough, we just help God along. But every time you help God along doing what you want to do uh, by racing ahead of God and not being led of God, you come up with huge mistakes. So now we have Jacob in this present state. And we see, first of all, Jacob is alone. Now this is after he's stolen the birthright and everything is his. He's on the run because now Esau is ready to come after him. No one's with him. His family isn't there. There's no servants, there's, there's, there's no animals, there's nothing. He is all alone, and he has very little with him. Jacob is, has, a, has a blemished past. He's made mistakes. His name alone must be terrible to be labeled because your name back then was your nature, so everybody knew who he was, what he did. His passion is real, but his efforts are regretful. His own frustration at not living up to his father's expectation. His parents' divided loyalty. There are a lot of real un, undealt with and unfinished issues in his life. Remind you of anybody? And while Jacob is on the run from his broken relationships, he's thinking his father must be angry and disappointed at being deceived his mother must be worried about his safety and his security. 
His brother wants him dead. And how ironic is it that he grabbed the firstborn's inheritance and the family's blessing, but he can't go home to claim it, and he can't fulfill it. So all his plotting and his scheming brought him nothing. He stops for the night, and the only place that he can find to rest is this, pl is this one place, and he finds a rock for a pillow. There is no comfort in this journey that Jacob is on. He's in the middle of nowhere. He's unsure about how anything that he's ever wanted is going to come true. Because you need to understand, God spoke to Rebecca and said, the elder is going to serve the younger. Well, I made everything in my life, designed it for it to happen. And now the blessing's mine. But I'm in a place where I wish I would have never done what I did. But I know what God said. The vision had to be true, but now I've gotten myself in a mess and he is stuck in a place of regret with questions, with worries, doubt, and despair. And all he's got is a rock to comfort him. I don't know if you've ever gone camping. I am not a camping girl. Okay. Did it once will never do it again. Never, ever, ever, okay? Never. Bugs, rocks, not my thing. That's why many times people, oh, we can go to this retreat house and that retreat house, and I, you know what? You go to a Karen Orlando retreat, we go in style, we are treated like princesses. I can guarantee you there will be no rocks and there will be no tents in Karen Orlando Ministries. Amen? I believe that I believe the princesses of God should be treated like royalty. Amen. So it's funny because here's the stones in our life. Jacob basically is a stone thrower. He's accused people. He's done a lot of bad things, but not only as a stone thrower, but now he's getting stones thrown at him. And he is running. He's running from his past, doesn't know where he's going, can't figure this stuff out. He doesn't know what his future is. And here in the midst of all his dysfunction, regardless of his past and his present condition, God still meets up with him and shows him this dream of a ladder. One thing that Jacob forgot was that God will always make a way out of no way. In all of Jacob's scheming and his thing, because it takes somebody to really think to be able to scheme. It takes some clever and true thinking. But the one thing that Jacob never thought of was but God. That if God said it, I don't have to do this. I just have to believe. I just have to be faithful. And I got to just trust in God that somehow, some way, he's going he's, he's gonna to work this thing out. And, you know, he must have been sitting there regretting and, and stewing over this whole thing day in and day out as he's walking, as he's sleeping. And the first thing he has to recognize is that there's a heaven and that there's a God in heaven that spoke a word over his life, that spoke a word over his father and his father's father. And a promise was made. And that a word that God speaks, it doesn't return void. And so he's not a king or a priest. He's a scoundrel at this point. But God doesn't care about it. God sees his promise. God does not see Jacob's past. He's not angry at Jacob for what Jacob did. God meets Jacob in the midst of his trouble 
and builds a bridge, gives him a ladder and says, you, the only way through this thing is up. You can only go up from here. I mean, think about it. God didn't go, God, God went for a scoundrel and then found a saint. Amen? That ladder is always there. God builds a bridge for you to get from one place to another. Doesn't care what you've been through. Doesn't care about your, about your past. The only one who cares about your past is you and the enemy. Now, I'm not saying your past is your past. Get over it and move on. We, we talked about it last night. There's a healthy way to move. Grieving is that bridge. By feeling things and coming to terms and understanding things and dealing with it, God can begin to heal. But there was a revelation that Jacob had to have. My past doesn't change my promise. Let me say that again. My past doesn't change my promise. Who and what God said that I am and that I will do, what he's promised me, is who I really am. My condition is not my Conclusion. Here's the beautiful thing. That, that dream that he has, and, and you know, this is why so many people think of God in such a condemning nature. That dream doesn't resurrect a shameful past, but it raises up a shining future. Because you know what? Jacob, because of the way he was raised and all the things that he went through, he forgot who he was. Because through it all, he believed his identity was wrapped up in what he did. He was taught in order to get something, you got to do something. No matter how you get it, if, if God said, we, we can do this, and not trusting in God. So there was a break. There was, there was something there that he, that he learned that wasn't good. But God doesn't hold that against him. God says today's the day of salvation. Today's the day that things can change. Because behold, I make all things new. You don't, you don't have to live in this state. You don't have to keep believing this lie. And I know that the, the journey is uncomfortable. But the journey will prove itself productive. The journey when we embrace it and when we go through it and we begin to trust God with it, it's going to bring forth fruit. It's going to bring forth life. And the thing that God, God doesn't rebuke him, God doesn't condemn him, but what God does, he gives him a threefold promise. I mean, how awesome is God that when Jacob messed up and did wrong, I mean, what he did to Esau, that was no mistake. That was intended. That was malicious. It was violating. He knew exactly what he was doing. And he wasn't trusting God. Faith was not even present. He was about a fivefold of that day. We're not even. Was not being kingdom-minded. But God comes back to him, and God reiterates the threefold promise. He says, what I gave to your father Abraham. He said, I'm going to give you. He says, first of all, let me tell you something. He goes, I am with you. I am with you. No matter where you go, no matter what you do, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. Because I spoke a word over you. And just because you've made some mistakes and just because you were taught the wrong thing, it doesn't matter. You see, my parents are not really my parents. My, my parent is Miss Father God. He was the one who birthed me. He was the one who created me. So regardless of what we've been through or what we've been taught, my God is my father. I belong to him. And it's what he has spoken over me. I, you know, I have dreams and wonderful things that I'd love to see my children do, but my dreams won't matter in my children's lives. 
until my dream becomes that you fulfill all that it is that God has for you. I don't hold their destiny. My job as a parent is to get them to where they know that God has them. Not what I want. Many people go into ministry, well, my daddy's church and my son. And sometimes it works that way. But sometimes, I mean, Absalom was not called to ministry. He was not called to take the kingdom, even though he was the first in line for the throne. Doesn't necessarily mean that. But God says, I, first, I, I'm with you. Jacob, you're out here all by yourself. I mean, how many people really feel alone in their situation? Feel like nobody understands me. Nobody's ever been where I've been. I can't talk to anybody about this. Like nobody understands me. God's telling you tonight, you're not alone. And you don't need everybody to understand you. You don't need everybody to counsel you. You don't need everybody to hold your hand. I am with you. And can I tell you that having God with you is enough? It's enough. Because God won't turn on you. And God will not lose patience with you. God says, I'm with you wherever, whenever, and forever. The second promise, and, and, you know, Jesus backs that up. He says, for lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the earth. The second new promise, he says, I'm going to watch over you wherever you go. Literally, it says that God will keep Jacob whenever, wherever, forever. That's why those regrets and those mistakes, the steps of a righteous man, are ordered. They're ordered of God. That's why the devil, when he comes in and he starts to begin to mess with your emotions and get your emotions to, to get you to, your emotions are running away with the situation, it's because he's trying to change your perception and change your perspective. Because it's all about where and how you see yourself in your situation. God says, I'm able to keep that which you committed. I'm able to perform that which I've promised. And the third promise, he says, I will bring you back to this land. He's telling Jacob, you're going to go home again. That's exciting. Because Jacob had a future. Jacob had a promise. But Jacob was too ashamed to go home. And God's saying, I'm wiping away. I'm wiping away all of this. You are going to be able to go home. This displaced thing will have a place. He was displaced. How many don't like to be displaced? It's a horrible feeling. But God said, this place that I've ordained is going to be your place. And you see, when, when Jacob is coming out of this, and after he has this dream, he says, my God, I've been, I've been so consumed with myself and my situation that I've not even realized that God has been with me the whole entire time. We've been sitting in the land of regret wondering, well, what would have happened and where would I be and, and what's this and what if I didn't lose my innocence and what if I didn't have this and what, what would have happened? And we think, you know, where was God when all this was happening? And what we fail to see because we see it with human eyes and we try to rationalize it with human mentality, we fail to see the things that God has done despite the circumstance. You know, God brought good out of it. See, sometimes I think we get stuck in ourselves that we say, well, I would have had so much more. Maybe, maybe not. But whatever it is, whatever you have, whatever, whatever you've acquired, it's because God was with you. Because if you would have went through what you went through, you would have ended up in a mental institution. You would have ended up in jail. You would have ended up in a hospital. You would have ended up in an abusive marriage. You would have ended up in a dead-end street. But because you were a word that God spoke, 
You're not in that place. You might not be where you want to be. And you might not be where God intends you to be. But you don't have to be stuck where you used to be. Because God's saying, what I'm doing for Jacob, I'm doing it for you. That's why God's called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. He's saying, I've given you a hope and a future. And your past. See, many times God is saying, I want to give you this, and I want to give you that, and I want to bless you here, and I want to bless you there. And we miss opportunities, and we miss open doors. Why? Because I'm so focused on what was last. And I'm so afraid to try again. Anybody afraid to try again? Because I just don't want to be disappointed. You know, I've had so many failed marriages. I mean, at least Elizabeth Taylor, man, she wasn't afraid to try. (laughs) She was not afraid to try. And I'm saying, you know what? All hope is not lost. But use a little wisdom this time and just go slower. And ask God for sign after sign after sign and wait for the fruit after fruit after fruit after fruit. Make sure you see the oranges and the apples and the pears and the peaches. And if you see any bananas, run. (laughs) But God can do it again. God can can raise you up from any place that you thought died. Because God is the master resurrection man. He, He loves, he can't be around anything dead. And if there are things in your life that died that you know God gave you, guess what? God will raise it up. God will raise it up because that's what he does. There are some things that need to die in our life. And God won't raise those things up. And we have an unhealthy obsession with dead stuff. We want to fixate on it. See, what I love about Jacob is he stopped throwing stones and started building with stones. Because when he realizes, he says, I'm going to call this place Bethel. I'm going to call this the house of God. Because I've had a God moment. I've had a God revelation here. And no more am I stuck between two thieves. Let him who stole steal no more. And Jacob takes the stone that he would normally throw at people, takes it, and he places it, and he pours oil out on it, and he begins to build an altar. See, those broken down places in your life those places that you missed those opportunities, that you had those regrets, those, those things. And maybe you just, you know, you're, 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 you're looking at your life and it's almost like Nehemiah. Remember when Nehemiah looked over the city and he wept because he saw nothing but ruins. You know, I, I was, uh, I picked up Bobby one day when he was working in the Rockaways, and I was, I was amazed at the, the rubble and, and just sheer ruins and devastation that happened there. And yet, you know, we look at it and we say, you know what, let's just clear all this junk and let's just make something new. We see what God wants you to do is kind of look over the ruins of your life, those crumbled pieces, and begin to take stone by stone and start building God an altar. Take the broken pieces of your life. Take every regret, the missed opportunity, the abuse, the hurt, the pain, the trauma, the divorce, the sickness, the loss of job, whatever it is, those broken pieces of your life, look at them like broken stone and start to take the pieces of your life and put it together and start to build an altar. And you will see 
that when you begin to take the broken pieces of your life and you begin to build an altar, it will become a place of praise. And when your ruins become a place of praise, when your past is dealt with and you can see, your past will become the place of praise. That you'll be able to say, God, I thank you for this mountain. See, something happens when you get into a place and you begin to praise, when, when you begin to, to worship. Jacob no longer feared men. He was running from Esau. He knew that Esau was going to kill him. And, he, and, and Esau wasn't wrong for doing that. Esau was the firstborn. And by rights, by the law, Esau should have had that birthright. But it was never Esau's to begin with. And if Jacob didn't make the mistakes and do what he did, if he would have trusted God, he wouldn't be running today. But regardless of what he did, he made a mess out of things. People around him made him a mess. He, I mean, it, the whole family was a mess. And yet, these are the people that God chose to be the father of our faith. All to prove a point. To prove a point to you and to prove a point to me. Your past doesn't matter. Your past doesn't influence who God calls you to be. doesn't matter. And so when you begin to take those, those stones and build that altar to God, that's how you get over the regret. Because any place of pain has got to become a place of praise. Praise transforms you. If you complain, you remain. But if you praise, you're raised. There's two types of faith. There's negative faith and there's positive faith. Whose report do you believe? Do you have faith only in the negative things or do you have faith in the positive things? And God's saying, I make, in this time, in this season, I have, I was flipping through the, the channels and I'm not kidding you, it, it had to be, I think, at least 10 different preachers restoration was every word that was coming out of everybody's mouth that this is a year of total recovery everywhere you go you're going to hear the message of restoration why it's not man's word it's not the theme but it is what God is doing it is what God is doing and I know I know that it's like you know what I've been there I've heard it, all this stuff, and I've never seen it come to fruition. But that can't stop you from believing. Because just because you haven't seen it yet doesn't mean that God's word is not true. Let me say that again. Just because you've never experienced it does not mean that that word is any less true. It's the same principle. Is even if you've been, if you've believed a lie for the past thirty years, it doesn't make the lie true. Truth is truth, and the time and the experience doesn't change the truth of God's word. God won't even change His word. God said, heaven and earth will pass away. But my word, it'll stand forever. Whose report will we believe? How long will you be stuck in that place between two thieves? Let him who stole steal no more. The enemy has stolen enough. Enough's enough. Take him back, my stuff. 
It's okay to get good and mad at the devil. If somebody broke into your house, would you offer them a cup of coffee and sit down? No. You would take whatever you could to defend yourself and throw that thief out. I guess today you'd get a wooden spoon or something. I don't know. You could throw something at him, I guess. Another sermon. Won't go there either. But no weapon formed against you shall prosper. I said, no weapon. No weapon. No matter what he's got in his arsenal, no matter what you did in your past, no matter what you didn't do in your past, no matter who did what to you in your past, God was not looking the other way. God was standing there, said you can touch their stuff, but you can't touch them because they belong to me. And I, God, laugh at the enemy because the things that he threw at you to destroy you are the very things that God is going to use you and build you and bring you into a place of promise, of uncommon favor. Want to encourage those? Your kids are crazy right now. They're not going to be crazy forever. The crazier they are, the more God is going to use them for, their, for, for his glory. Your financial state right now, see, that's what I love about Jacob too. Is the first thing that Jacob did, and we see a principle. He built God altar. He gave him praise. And then he says, I'll give you a tenth of everything. I'm going to plant my seed on this because I believe it. Sometimes, I think all the time, we got to name our seed. Tell God what I'm believing for. Because when I give, I'm showing God I trust him. And I'm believing in him. So if you need health, you sow your seed tonight. I want full recovery. And write it in the memo. I want full recovery of my health, of my mind, of my home, of whatever it is that you need restored. From this moment on, I want you to put that command on that seed and name it. Tell God what you want and then praise him for it. And trust him. And then know that God is going to do what he said he's going to do. Amen? Amen. Come on, let's bow our heads. Father God, we just thank you tonight. Lord, I thank you for this word. I thank you, Lord, that we no longer have to be caught between two thieves. But Father, we can look to you, the hope of all glory. And know that when we look to you, our help comes from you. Our deliverance comes from you. And Father, I thank you tonight that all things are being made new. All things are being restored. And Father, right now I lift up to you every impossible situation. Every impossible situation for those people that are stuck in wherever they are in their situations, Father. Lord, we decree and we declare, Father God, that you're going to make a way where there is no way. Lord, where there is no job, you're going to provide a job, Father God. Lord, for those that are losing houses, we thank you that no weapon formed against them shall prosper. For those that are sick in their body, Father God, Lord, we thank you for healing. We thank you, Lord, that we are ready, Lord, to evict the unwanted visitor, Father God. And let our house become a house of praise, Father God. Thank you, Lord. We declare tonight, nothing is too hard for you. Praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your praise report and your prayer requests and your offering tonight, Kathy's going to be by to give that. Uh, excited we have our women at the well meeting.